Uh, welcome to the Highland Heights Bible class. Uh, we are in week eight, nine, nine, nine. nine. Week nine. Okay. Uh, uh, in week nine's class, which is what we're doing right now, we are going to finish up Acts chapter two. Who would have thought that we would spend nine weeks on one chapter? Now, obviously we've have, uh, yeah, okay, Jeremy thought that because he planned it out that way. Uh, we've had other Bible classes that have gone on for years now they've covered a whole book and we're only covering one chapter, but um, we're going to finish up in our section verses 42 through 47. We're going to talk about uh, hospitality and some uh, connected issues there. Uh, if you haven't been with us before, please pause the video, uh, go and read Acts chapter two in its entirety. Um, after you pause, pick it back up here and we're going to read starting in verse 42 and that'll launch us into our conversation. So let's read along Acts chapter two starting in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay. So our topic for these nine weeks has been, what does it mean to be the church? And Acts chapter 2 is the perfect template for that because it's the beginning. It's, it's this pure version of what it looks like when God's people come together for the first time and say, how do we do this? And they start, they start living out what God is wanting them to do. Uh, tonight, we're going to focus on verse 46, but we've covered a lot of stuff, so we'll probably reference to other places as well. Uh, we have a second mentioning of breaking bread. It, it appears earlier in verse 42, but now in verse 46, we get a daily interaction of attending the temple uh, together and breaking bread in their homes. So uh, perhaps the word that we would most closely associate with this idea is hospitality, uh, that they were in each other's homes, that they were sharing meals together. Um, and there's also uh, the word attending there, we'll maybe talking uh, talk about attendance. Um, so anyway, there's, there's several ideas going on here on what it means to be a part of a group. So, uh, Jeremy, what, what are you seeing here? What's going on? Well, when I, what I'm seeing is it's a topic we brought up before, this concept of hospitality. Um, there were some pretty set hospitality customs that existed in the first century, particularly within the Jewish community. Um, in fact, uh, some of the uh, synagogues in the diaspora, the, uh, the Jewish dispersion outside of Palestine, would actually have a guest room, um, you know, kind of like a small version of a parsonage. Uh, um, that we might think of today, but the purpose of this room was traveling rabbis would be able to stay there. So Jews would have a place to stay. Um, and so this idea of hospitality, um, there were, there were some good inns in, in Italy. Otherwise you probably didn't want to stay in an inn in the first century, particularly if you were out in the Gentile world. So you would stay in people's homes. People who were part of your group would welcome you in. Um, and we've, we've alluded also to the idea that you have Christians here who they, they've traveled to Jerusalem and they're staying in Jerusalem beyond the amount of time that they intended to stay in Jerusalem. Um, they, they've extended their stay beyond what they've planned. And so what we've got going on here seems to be, at least in part, a situation where they were welcoming these people into their homes, bringing them in, um, having a meal with them. You mentioned uh, this is the second time we've seen breaking of bread. Um, the first time probably refers to, as we talked about, the communion, the Lord's Supper. This time it's referenced daily, it's referenced in their home. This probably refers to shared communal meals that they had together. And it's this idea of caring for the pilgrim, okay? But even more than that, um, this is something they were together daily. Um, it specifically says in this verse, attending the temple, breaking bread in their homes on a daily basis. Well, if you're around someone 
that much. If you're there and you're present in someone's life that much, you're going to build a relationship. And that is, is really the effect that this is going to have. They are building relationships within the body. Let's remember, these are not people that knew each other. Okay, they came from all over the Roman world. They may or may not have acquaintances in Jerusalem. And though if they do, those acquaintances, those friends may or may not be part of this body. So they are building a community. And the best way to build a community is to be around one another, to be together. They are present in one another's lives. And that's where kind of the, the first foundations of that fellowship begin to be built is they're around each other, they're getting to know each other, they're present in each other's lives. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, you bring up the, the Jewish roots uh, that are seen here. Um, I, I'm pulling up a verse, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 19. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were so, sojourners in the land of Egypt. Uh, mm -hmm. Because God's people have been outsiders, God wants his people to treat outsiders well. Um, we reflect on our own experience of being outside of the church, and it is because that we, we know what it felt like to be an outsider that we treat outsiders well when they come in, um, that we want to open up uh, the house of God and our house, which was given to us by God, to those uh, who um, are in need and to those who we are wanting to build relationships together uh, with them. Now, Acts chapter two, it's, you know, it, it, we're getting uh, the idea that there's a progression of time here, but at the same time, it's probably not too long of a period. So as you were saying, they did not know each other before then. And so it doesn't take a lot to build these relationships when you're around each other that often. It's because of the intensity of the relationship uh, that it, it grows so quickly. Uh, this is something we'll, we'll probably get into a little bit more later when you're asking yourself the question, well, why can't I make friends? Or um, why aren't we able to talk about the deep issues that I, I really think that Christians should be talking about? Maybe you're not spending enough time with each other. Maybe uh, the reason you haven't gotten there in conversation with is because you haven't had the basic get to know you conversations yet. You haven't allowed for that to happen. When, uh, when people have a common mission, that common mission has brought them together. That's everything in Acts chapter 2. Everyone is convicted in the same way, convicted to their hearts. They've all given their lives over to the way. And now that they share this common mission, it's changing the way that they are interacting with each other. People that would have been total strangers beforehand are now uh, best friends. They are housemates. They are someone that they share a meal with. So it's an intimate relationship that is built up in a short period of time. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. It's, it's the idea of, of, of presence, of being there and being there daily. Um, you know, like you said, well, 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 why don't, why can't we talk about these things? Well, have, do you know each other all that well? I mean, how many of us feel comfortable delving into the deep aspects of spirituality or, you know, sharing with sharing that we, we need help, we need assistance with something. How many of us feel comfortable doing that with a total stranger? Well, well of course not. Okay. Um, it's, that's, that's the idea that, that we see with this idea of fellowship is growing closer. Okay. And, you know, again, that can't be done if we're not physically present. And that you've seen, you've seen a lot of that talked about over um, the past few months when, for reasons of public health, because we do care about one another and we want to be safe around one another. Um, and of course, we also want to get rid of this thing so we can actually go back out into the real world. Um, we have to be physically separate. Um, you know, I've, I've seen several memes. Um, they're really, they really hit me because they said, you know, you know it's bad when even the introverts want to leave their house. Um, which, you know, that, that's me. And I, I feel that. Um, but even even those who are more introverted still need human contact. That's how you build a relationship is by being in one another's lives regularly um, and being willing to open up and, and to remember that shared mission and that shared purpose you were talking about earlier. So what does, 
we, we, we've kind of hit at it and we, we've kind of beat around the bush here. What does fellowship look like? And what is, what's the biblical example for fellowship? And um, how can we be more specific? Uh, we both said being in each other's lives. What does that look like? What are the lessons we can draw? Well, I mean, we want, well, fellowship can be kind of hard to define because we, we use it in so many different ways, you know, fellowshipping, we, we mean, sometimes we mean agreeing with one another on something. Sometimes we just mean, you know, eating, af eating after Sunday morning worship or, or eating on Sunday evening. We have a quote unquote fellowship meal. And you think about those meals though, what, what they allow for is a time outside of the formal worship service for us to talk and to share in one another's lives, to talk about the things that, that we're going through, to talk about what our jobs are like, what, what our lives are like, what, what crazy thing had, did my toddler say today? You know, and if you live with a three-year-old, there's a whole list of crazy things your three-year-old says on a regular basis. Um, but that's, that's the idea that, that we're getting at here is building relationships because we are a family. We've we talked um, a couple of times about this idea of social capital. Um, if everything around you collapsed, um, what would you do? Where would you go? And we've said, if you're in the church, you have social capital. If you if you're on the verge of losing your house, you've got people who will be there for you. Well, the reason those people will be there is we built that relationship. And again, you know, we we've talked about this idea of we grow closer to one another by growing closer to God. Well, God wants to be in our lives. Um, you know, we, we talk about prayer. God wants us to take our petitions to him. Does God need us to tell him? No, he doesn't need us to tell him. But in telling him, we recognize that there's a relationship there. We're showing trust in him saying, God, I am willing to tell you this um, among myriad other things that we're doing there. That's just one aspect of it. But, but that's part of what's going on there is we're, we're sharing with God. Well, we do the same thing with one another, that horizontal relationship. Okay. So, and they are, they're in one another's homes. Okay. You, you notice they're not just in the upper room, which, you know, 3000 were added on that day. So that's a big upper room. Um, hard to do social distancing in that, at, in that space, but they're, they're not just only around each other one, two, three times a week. They're around each other constantly, all the time. This is family, okay? And that's essential to building the community. Um, you know, the, in Galatians, there's, there's that wonderful verse, Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens. Okay, notice there's an R there. It does not say to be one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. Well, the way we bear one another's burdens is by sharing, having that relationship with one another to build the bonds of community. And then that builds this idea of loving one another um, and, and caring for one another because we know each other. Yeah, that, that knowledge that is built up. It, um, we often talk about how much we, we love God and we want to sing his praises. Um, yet we, sometimes we don't want to put in the hard work of getting to know God. Uh, the same goes for people, um, for, for anyone who is married or has been married, you, you know, that it's one thing to say that you love a person. It's another thing to put in the hard work of getting to know the person, getting to, to know what makes them tick, uh, what makes them happy. their life better. And uh, while none of us will ever have a relationship in the church that uh, is as intimate as one that we would have with the spouse, just because hopefully your spouse is in the church too. And so it's, it's really easy just to have that real a super relationship. We still have to put in a lot of hard work to, to build quality relationships, even within the church. And Think about it too, uh, to the extent that we are trying to evangelize, that we are trying to reach out to coworkers who don't know God or someone that we come into regular contact with, the way that you work towards bringing them to Christ is building up a relationship, 
showing them fellowship, showing them what hospitality looks like in the church that is attractional. It, it, it shows them uh, how God can change their life too. Uh, now, we're not perfect, and so we don't want them to change to be more like us, but we show them uh, what Jesus can do through his people. Um, can we talk a little bit about um, just the, the practical difficulties of fellowship, of hospitality in a church with 600 people? Um, in I, So let's set aside social distancing and COVID-19. Let's say we all came back together. It's still hard to do this, right? How, how do we um, how do we get past that? Well, I mean, it's it's hard. It's it's a challenge. Um, you know, the the study, the social science studies, and all show us that the larger the group, the harder it is to form those those intimate relationships. Just because one, there's just more people, and two, the larger the group, the more likely you're going to run into someone that you don't personality wise mesh so well with, and you know, and that's that's normal. That's natural. You're not going to. Yeah, that's be, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. We're not saying you have to be absolute best bosom buddies with everyone that that you see and everyone that walks through the door. There's going to be you know different personalities attract and things like that. But the the key is, um, do we make ourselves open? Okay, do we allow ourselves? And listen, that is harder for some people than others. Some people are much more private people. Um, and, and by the way, this is not an introvert, extrovert kind of thing, okay? Um, this is more of a, just some people, they're more private than other people. But the thing is, we have to um, work on being open, um, being available to people. Um, do we make ourselves available? Do we make ourselves open? Or do we, as we've probably all seen in the past, people that come in during the first song and leave during the last song? I mean, you know, and have we found the problem there? I mean, just the, to be blunt, have, have we found the problem there of, you know, not being open, not being available? It's, it's not that the relationships are possible. They just might take a little bit more work. Um, you know, and, and some people say, might say, well, well, well no, one, no one talks to me. Well, do we try to talk to people? Um, you know, it takes two to build a relationship. And look, you're not going to be able to build a relationship with everyone. That's natural. That's normal. Um, but being open to that and being willing to, to be open to building that relationship and opening ourselves up to that, that I think is key. And to remember also that, look, building relationships take time, takes time. I'll get the word out in a minute and takes effort you're not going to be and you're not going to be able to build the same level of relationship with everyone but being available to, but it, the more you try to find those relationships the larger a pool you have to work from of people to actually you know build the relationship with so it really comes down to in some sense is a matter of faith God said, this is my community. Do we trust God enough to let this be his community and his community for us? Right. Uh, yeah, kind of connecting uh, the thing you said there at the end with what you said at the beginning. Um, if we trust God that he has established the church, that and specifically, I, I'm not sure if everyone's willing to go with me on this, but that he... Um, that he has a lampstand for Highland Heights, that there is something, there is a specific mission. I, I'm not, I'm not saying that we, I'm not saying that, uh, that, that there is some pre-knowledge of the future. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that the future is established or anything like that, but what I'm saying is that there is a specific mission, which is kind of this general uh, movement for the church to do something. Okay, so if we believe that that's true, going back to the beginning of what you said, Jeremy, then we also believe that because of that general mission, there's going to be very different groups of people, people that I that I don't get along with, people that I do get along with really well, and part of uh, part of the challenge of being the bride of Christ, of entering into this intimate relationship 
is learning to get along with people. Um, even the people you really like will have bad days. Um, and uh, not, not just kind of dismissing uh, that member of the, of the congregation because, well, we don't get along well, so I'm not going to uh, bear their burdens. I'm not going to be fully uh, yoked with a brother or sister who I just don't get along with it as well. So it, it, takes, uh, it takes time and it takes commitment, a commitment above comfort, uh, because if we are uncomfortable, we will very quickly throw aside those relationships that aren't, aren't doing it for us. So um, just to kind of think through uh, the, the numbers that, as, as you were alluding to, we have eight elders at Highland Heights. And if we think about, you know, uh, shepherds looking over the flock, that would mean that there's 75 sheep for each one of them. Um, so to the extent that uh, it's hard to have 75 close relationships, uh, one of the best things that shepherds can do is make sure that uh, there is um, there are groups of people that are taking care of each other and making sure that there are social connections within the flock. That um, it's the, the the analogy starts breaking down once you start saying that sheep have friends. But anyway, do, let's bear with me with this. Um, that you you uh, as the shepherd is looking, and I think all members are capable of doing this. That that we're capable of seeing someone who is disconnected, who um, is not feeling welcome. And Jeremy, as you, as you alluded to, sometimes that is brought on by themselves. I'm going to take a guess and say that anyone that's watching this video um, probably does a decent job of when they, when they come to church, that they're, they're not going to leave immediately uh, as, the, as the closing prayer is said, that they're making some social effort to be there. Although, um, if any of our any of the people who are participating in this class have had that negative experience, that's certainly a valid one. It's it's not always your fault. You know, you you can do all of the right things and still not feel welcome in a in a crowded room. So um, it it as Jeremy said, you have to have both sides come together. Individuals who are willing to put in the hard work, staying staying after. Uh, maybe being lonely for a little bit, or maybe having that awkward conversation that eventually leads to more natural conversations that leads to deeper relationships. It doesn't have to be the perfect relationship uh, on week one. Um, at the same time, uh, I so this is this is uh, me doing propaganda for us education deacons. I think the easiest way to make friends is to go to Bible class, and is to go into those smaller groups where those, relation, those uh, relationships will more easily be built up. Um, you know, depending on the class where you go, within the Bible class, you might be talking with each other, and that's just going to build up familiarity with each other. I, I know for me, um, when I think about where I'm going to make friends in the future, I think about Bible classes. I, I think about being in those places where we're able to have spiritual conversations, and it's much easier to find commonalities once I've, I've – uh, been able to look into someone's soul and see the the spiritual comfort I have with them there. Uh, let me really quickly talk about um, the word hospitality. I think that there is uh, there's kind of two sides here that I think are worth talking about. Um, I think that we as Christians, when we think about uh, breaking bread in each other's homes, um, hopefully we're doing it at all. Right? If, if you've had zero people into your home in the past year, uh, I would recommend, uh, once this whole COVID-19 thing is over, uh, try to have one person. Try to have one family into your home. Uh, if you've had one last year, try to have two. You know, uh, it's the sort of thing where it should be a habit. It should be something that, um, that is part of our Christian life. I, I think I would go as far as to say that um, just because it's mentioned as one gift that some people have, it's not a gift that some people lack entirely. Part of being a Christian is taking on the hospitable spirit of, of God himself. God himself is hospitable. Um, let me, one other challenge, and then uh, I know we want to talk about having trust in people and grace there too. Um, 
one other challenge here is that uh, sometimes we get into the rut of only inviting our friends to our homes, right? Um, the, the, our home, our hearth is an intimate place. Um, and so we, we only want to invite in people that we already like and know really well. well. I think part of being a Christian is like we see in Acts chapter two, inviting in people to our home that we've only known for a week. Uh, or maybe even at least, you know, inviting them out for a meal, um, trying to establish new relationships rather than being dependent on the old relationships, which are good, we should keep, but also trying to de develop others as well. Um, part of that development process is building trust with people and showing grace to people uh, that might not have otherwise deserved, or they haven't shown that they deserve it yet. Uh, Jeremy, how do we think about building trust, showing grace to other people? Well, one one reason I think that people may not want to be open is they've been burned in the past. Um, they they just there's a lack of trust, or maybe they made some mistakes and they don't feel the grace that we're supposed to have. You know, um, maybe they feel like um, if they open up about the challenges in their lives, that those things are going to be held against them, or even even worse, uh, and, and being held against them, after, holding it against them um, after grace has been given is bad enough, but that not only will it be held, continue to be held against them, but also that everyone will know about what has happened. Um, and so that, that can burn those bridges of trust that can burn those bridges of grace. Um, maybe we've been, maybe we've been burned by, a, um, a difficult situation. We've gone to a congregation that was very cliquish. Okay. And, and let's understand something. You're going to have people you get along with better than others. That's normal. The danger of cliquishness is not where you have a group of people that, that you are friends with. It's where you don't let anyone else in. You know, I've got my circle and boom, we're, we're good. We've, we've got our requisite 12 to 15 intimate relationships and, you know, and, you know, no vacancies here, you know, not taking applications at this time. Um, don't, maybe we, maybe you've been burned by that as well. Um, we need to make sure that we allow people to fail. And by the way, it, again, it takes two on both sides of this equation, allow people to fail. Um, it's natural to be gun shy if you've been burned by a previous organ by a previous situation, but but make the effort to to not let that impact your relationships with people who weren't involved. On the other hand, look if someone care if someone has enough trust and enough love for you to open up about, up about the struggles that they're going through, and they are genuinely penitent and genuinely trying to change. Remember, change, you know, change is not something that happens like that. It's a process. Um, what are they, I forget how long they say it takes to break a habit, but sin can be habit forming. It takes a long time to break that habit. Okay. There might be backsliding and things like that. Give people the sense that they can trust you to pick them up when they fall. Okay. And again, that's, again, this is both sides of the equation. Allow yourself to be open to, uh, you know, don't just expect everyone else to share their lives. If, if you're not going to share yours, mm -hmm. on the other hand, be willing to share your life with people. Um, and one of the biggest things I can say, and I've alluded to this, be worthy of the trust. Please don't gossip. Please don't gossip. Okay. Um, just, just be blunt about it or, you know, do prayer requests, you know, in the church, we don't gossip. We have prayer requests. Um, don't do that. See, the reason gossip is so bad on the fellowship is it corrodes trust. Think about it. You open up, you share a struggle with someone that you're having, thinking it's going to be between you and they're going to help you. You come into church the next week and everyone is whispering about it. You going to trust that person again? Probably not. Okay. But, and that goes to this idea of for people to be willing to trust, we have to be worthy of it. Be there, be in people's lives, show grace. And, and on the other side, be willing to allow people to fail and show grace to them as well. Um, 
you know, and again, we're not talking about ignoring persistent sin that someone is clearly not trying to, to move beyond that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about giving people an opportunity to grow beyond their sin. Okay. Be real with people. Treat people the way Christ treated them. He picked people up when they were down and he helped them, especially the people that genuinely felt penitent and remorse. Yeah, it, it, it is a modeling of the behavior of Christ to, to, give, uh, to give more grace than the person deserves and to be the first mover, uh, to be the one that shows trust and reciprocates trust. And even when the person fails us, to go back again and to say, I trust you again. And I, you think about uh, Jesus after he was resurrected, going to Peter. Peter, I know you failed me. But he actually, he said, "Feed my sheep." But you know, my subtext where I'm reading into what Jesus said is, "Peter, I know what you did, and I'm I want you back in the I want you back in the fold. I want you back in the good work that needs to be done." We as Christians sometimes are very quick to uh, go against those who have burned us in the past, um, and that just causes division. It, no one is saying that it's not painful when that happens, uh, that it's not painful uh, when there seems to be an other group out there that is either talking bad about us or just ignoring us completely. Um, but because we trust in God, uh, we give a second effort, a third effort, a seventh effort to go back and try to establish uh, good relations with God's church. Um, and you know, we're not pretending that that is always easy. That's just a, a part of what it means to be a part of God's church. We're a little over our 30 minutes. So, uh, Jeremy, what, what's some closing thoughts? What's, uh, I don't know, should we do closing thoughts for the entire series? But what, I don't know, at least tonight, what, what's the thing that we walk away with uh, from this lesson? The closing thoughts for tonight, make the effort. Um, we're... We are not built for complete solitude. Um, one of my favorite sayings is we are built to be in community. And listen, some people do better with community. Some people don't. Um, we've alluded to the difference between introversion and extroversion. And we could, well, we don't have time to get into unpacking all of that. But make the effort. None of us is built to be alone. That's why God gave us the church. Um, you know, I saw a poster, a meme somewhere i don't remember where um but it said that you know marriage is not 50 50 some days it's 80 20 some days it's 20 80 um yeah that works um some you know and and it, the percentages move based on on who's having the the worst day you know um and that's the way our lives work too make the effort because the effort will be so rewarding when you realize that you have 100, 200, 300, 600 people that when you're in a crisis, you can count on them. Um, I've mentioned before, my wife has said that she doesn't know how we would have survived without the church. Um, and and the, the example I always give is, is how often we've moved. Um, we're not planning on moving again. So, you know, this is it. But, you know, we've lived in eight different houses in 16 years, eight different houses slash apartments in 16 years of marriage. The church has been there to move us every time, but we've also moved two years after we got married. We moved 700 miles away from both of our parents. Um, Amy had an aunt and uncle 45 minutes away, um, but that was the closest family. The first thing we did was found a church home, and they welcomed us in and opened us up. If you're ever in the Austin area and you need a place to go, Westside Church of Christ in Round Rock is a great place to go. Um, same thing happened when we moved to Tyler, Texas. Same thing happened when we moved here to Smyrna. Um, that and that forms the core of, of those attachments and those relationships. And when that is what helps us grow closer to God is we lift one another up. We build one another up. We don't have to do this alone. It's a, it's a hard world out there to be a Christian. We don't have to do it alone. While we're promoting churches in Austin, my brother and his family and my sister-in-law and her family 
go to the Brentwood Oaks congregation. So if you're visiting Austin, many different. Also, I just want to say also a wonderful congregation. The school I taught at in Austin was actually a ministry of the Brentwood Oaks um, Church of Christ. So I've been in that auditorium just as often as I've been in the one at West Side. But you're absolutely right. Sorry. Uh, closing thoughts here. Um, if you are not a good cook, that's okay. If you have a messy house, that's okay. Now, uh, I, I think I should, I should aim this at guys there, you know, oftentimes my wife will probably tell me it's because I'm not willing to clean up that we can't have more people over. So I need to do a better job of cleaning up the house. Right. So anyway, I, I bring that up to say this. Don't let some outside meaningless thing, and I really do say that, that cleanliness of house and quality of your food is meaningless compared to the relationships that can be built. Um, as I love seeing my brothers and sisters in the church building. We have a great church building. Love it. It's not as good as being in someone's home. You cannot build the quality relationships in a church building you can build in someone's home. It cannot be done. Uh, we can do a pretty good job and we should do it often. We should be there often, but uh, do your best to make sure that you are trying to build those relationships outside of the home because that's where it becomes not just a four hour a week relationship, but a lifelong, you know, middle of the night if you need them relationship uh, that is more like what I think God is calling us to. So, um, Acts chapter two, read it, uh, read it often to, to remind yourself about what it means to be a part of God's church. Next week, we're going to continue on. Uh, we're going to have, uh, we're going to talk about the remnant and what it means to be God's left behind people or chose chosen people. I guess left behind has a bad connotation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, how many weeks are we going to spend over there? Uh, right now, three weeks. We got three okay. weeks for that, and we'll we'll see how that goes. If we need to go farther, we can. Well, who knows? Who knows how long we'll talk about it? But anyway, all right. Thank you for for being a part of this class, and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you.